go ahead and start recording. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, I am so glad to have you with us today. Um, I am going to talk to you today about writing and deploying software on the cloud. Um, and we'll cover things such as what is the cloud? Um, what does it mean to uh, deploy software nowadays? How do companies do really complicated things? Um, we're going to cover a lot of ground, but I've also uh, got almost 100 slides, which are almost entirely diagrams um, with a lot of animation. Uh, so I hope that we will be able to make this very easy to understand. Um, and so we will kind of go ahead and dive right into this. I'm going to share my screen. So you should be able to see that now. Um, and uh, I'll double check, make sure that that is working. Uh, or someone in the chat can let me know that you got a, uh, that you can see the screen, then, then that would also be great. Um, if not, I'm gonna really quickly double check on this other laptop. I don't have Cora here. Uh, there we go, yeah, I can see. Cool. I don't have Cora here, um, so I'm kind of just uh, trying to figure this out myself. Cool. So uh, writing and deploying software on the cloud, um, basically what we're talking about is um, moving software from your computer to the internet um, like a real company. Uh, if you're just yourself, it's pretty easy to just copy and paste files, uh, but that's not how we really do it in the real world. Um, so I'll talk a, a little bit about um, what we're going to learn today. There are four things uh, that we're going to cover today, and there's a lot more than this to know uh, in real life, but four things that are, I think, the fundamentals of, of where things have been going recently. So one is going to be containers. And you may have gone to another talk about Docker. We're going to talk about that again. We're going to get, go into just the basics of this, not all of the, you know, the deep technical details of how to create a Docker container, but generally what they are and how they work. Two, we're going to talk about cloud computing. You've probably heard of the cloud. Most people don't really have a good visualization of what it is. This is going to be the shortest section of our thing because it's actually not that complicated. Three, we are going to talk about container orchestration. Um, and that's going to refer back to that initial thing about containers. We're going to talk about how we can use multiple containers together in really cool ways. And four, we're going to talk about something called CI or CD, um, continuous integration or continuous, uh, I think it's the continuous deployment. It might be continuous delivery. Um, which is about uh, how we sort of automate a lot of this process and make sure that we're, we're shipping software that doesn't break um, and that is uh, high quality. So let's dive into it. We're going to start off with uh, first topic is containers. So uh, there's this phrase that I've heard of uh, dependency hell, um, which is the, you know, sort of one of the things that this can refer to is, is just like fundamentally all software needs things, right? And so you'll see uh, descriptions if you go to an open source project or something like that, that might say something like use Node.js version 14, right? Or you might say, see something that says you need FFmpeg uh, dev to build, or you know you need to make sure that port 80 is open because the software is going to listen on port 80, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All software needs something. At the very minimum, software needs a certain computer architecture or things like that. We can't really fix that with Docker. Like, you're going to need a computer either way. We can fix a lot of this. I mean, I, th I think everyone's had this experience where you've tried to install software and, like, some package is missing or something, and then you try to find some instructions online for installing that package, but then the instructions are wrong or they're for an old version of your thing, and you spend, like, two or three hours trying to, to fix that. Um, and there's some other problems as well. Uh, so um, the old way to do things, if you wanted to run multiple pieces of software on a single physical machine, would be to just put them in some directories and run both of them. So you can see in this example, uh, you know, I have two applications, app1 and app2, and they have an app.py each, and they have a requirements.py, which or, um, I think should be requirements.txt, but um, in Python defines what packages are necessary. And this is how we would do things in the past, and there's a few problems that they, this can cause. What if they both need a different version of Python, right? There are ways to install multiple versions of Python, but it's not necessarily super easy, um, especially not on uh, machines that aren't really expecting you to have, you know, five different versions of Python or something like that. What if they both need different versions of a specific package? Again, there's ways to deal with this, but it's not super easy. Here's one that's really hard to deal with. What if they both need uh, you know, different versions of a library that's a system-wide library? 
and especially if it's like a minor version, there's usually not separate packages for that on a lot of operating systems. And so what you would need is you would need to go out and like manually compile it and put it in the right place. And like, it's just a mess, right? Like it's, it's a mess, it's confusing. If you wanna start a second server, you have to copy everything over and follow all these instructions again. And so what a lot of times you, you would end up with is a list of like, you know, detailed step-by-step -step instructions on how to configure this application. And then even then things would change and people would come on board the team and they would try to deploy this and things would break. Uh, and this is how a lot of people deploy software up until, I don't know, maybe 2010 to 11 at, at the earliest. This is how everyone did everything. Um, so now here's the modern way. It's using something called uh, containers, which are usually based on a platform called Docker, although there are technically other options. So the way that Docker works is you kind of have two separate little operating systems here, right? Each individual application has its own file structure, has its own version of Python, has its own packages, uh, and has, it's it basically an entire separate operating system. Uh, now there's some, you know, some complications there we'll talk about later that actually make it fast because obviously this would be slow. Traditionally, this would be very slow and very inefficient. And there are ways that they've made this faster that sort of share some of that between them, but not nearly as much as, as, as typically. Um, so the idea is we have these two completely self-contained um, versions of our application and they're managed by this thing called Docker and Docker is this suite of things, one of which is this definition of what a container looks like, one of which is the source code, um, you know, the sort of programming language for creating containers and one of them is this thing that sort of manages all of the containers and can start and stop them and a bunch of other things. And so what will happen is that, it, you know, a lot of these requests will actually end up kind of coming into Docker and then Docker will remap things. Uh, so a specific example, let's say that your app one needs port 80 and app two maybe also needs port 80. Typically, you can't have two applications listening on the same port. But what Docker can do is it can automatically remap, say we say port 8001 goes to port 80 on this container and port 8002 goes to port 80 on this container. Docker will remap those and it'll, it'll take care of that for us. Another thing Docker can do is let's say that both, app, let's say you have two applications, it's the same exact application. They both are intending to write to the same directory, but for some reason you wanna write two of them. Well, what's gonna happen is these applications when they're trying to write to a folder will talk to Docker and you can tell Docker, I want to map this, uh, you know, my slash folder to the, you know, this separate folder in my home directory. So Docker is kind of acting as this intermediary between these, these individual containers and these individual containers can, can think that they're an entirely self-contained, they're their own operating system, they're the only thing on the server, they can add or remove packages or whatever uh, as much as you want and Docker is going to take care of translating everything. I, between the uh, containers and the actual operating system. So what does a container look like? This is generally what a, uh, the source code to build a container will look like. And there's, there's two stages here, right? There's the building stage where we build a container. It's kind of like building an executable or um, building a jar file or anything like that. We're gonna build it first and then we'll, we'll run it from that compiled version, which is called an image. So the source code that we use to define one of these containers, the thing that we're building, looks a lot like this. And it's, it's in a file called Docker file. That's what it's always called. You put it in a directory, and then if you run docker build in that directory, it'll automatically build uh, by compiling this docker file into an image. So here's what it looks like. Um, and so we'd run docker build, it produces an image, and then we'd run docker run, and that executes that image. It's kind of the same thing again as how you would build a jar, and then you would execute the jar, and they're separate steps, um, because the compilation process can sometimes be quite slow, and so having that pre-built uh, is a little bit more efficient. Uh, or we could also do docker push. And uh, Docker has this really cool thing uh, called a container registry, which is kind of like a centralized location for all of your images. Um, it, it's kind of like the equivalent of like the app store on Apple, um, but for uh, you know, server images instead of things that you can download to your phone. And so we can actually Docker push our container up to the cloud and then other people can run it directly from there, um, which is pretty neat. So that if someone, if our uh, image is on the cloud, we just run Docker pull and then Docker run. Um, or Docker run will actually run Docker pull for you if it's missing. Um, and so you can see this for other things as well. Like uh, all of Code Day software is actually on Docker Hub, 
And so you can Docker pull code day slash www, and you'll get a full local uh, image of the code day website. And if you run code day, uh, Docker run, you will get a running version of the code day website, um, which is pretty neat. So again, I really want to emphasize there are two steps here. There's the build step and the run step. And they don't even have to be done on the same machine. You can build something and then run it separately at some other time. So let's go back and look at this code again, and, and we'll talk about it. But you do really need to remember that there are those two steps. Most of this is going to apply to the build step, but some of this will apply to the run step later. We'll tell it what to do when it runs. It's like a startup script. So we can say uh, we're loading our base image, which is kind of like an operating system. Um, there's a bunch of base images. One of the neat things about Docker is you can extend other ones. So Python 3.8 is actually extending like an actual operating system, and then it's just installing Python for you. But I could say from Ubuntu or something like that. Um, in this case, I know that I'm going to need Python 3.8. The Python team thankfully publishes a bunch of Docker images for Python 3.8. And so what I can do is I can just say from Python 3.8, it'll pull down their operating system with Python 3.8 already installed. Then I'm going to say I want to run apt-get update, update and apt-get install ffmpeg dev. Um, so same thing as what we were talking about on an actual operating system where you would, you know, you'd need to install software. We can do that in here, but it's going to be installed inside of this sort of almost like a virtual machine, like a fake operating system running inside of your real operating system. And this will get compiled down into that image that can then be run later. So this will run at the build time. Again, I want to stress that this is running every time you hit Docker build, not when you do Docker run. Docker run runs a built image that already has this executed. Uh, so then I'm going to say copy requirements.txt. Um, so basically, I'm copying this from my local computer to the application. And uh, you'll actually see the same thing again down lower. We'll copy this from the source directory to the app slash source directory on this image. So the first version of copy is coming from your computer. The second one is kind of going to the Docker container file system. So again, this is being built into the image. And you can see, again, there's some more run commands and some things like that. The reason we separate this out into different steps is actually for a performance thing. And we'll talk about that at, right at the end of this Docker section. And then finally, the, the, uh, this last command, cmd, this is going to be what happens when the container starts. So even though this is part of the source code, this is actually not run at build time. This is saying when someone runs Docker run, this is what's going to happen on startup. So that's generally what a Docker file looks like. It's not super, super complicated. Um, and generally, most of the Docker files that I've written have probably been under 15 lines of code, because a lot of the complicated stuff is sort of taken care of by just choosing something that already has like Python installed. Um, a lot of the time, it's just about installing one or two dependencies. I think the longest one I have is maybe 30 or 40 lines of code. And that's one that has like some very weird specific requirements. Now, the thing is, this is actually quite fast. So traditionally, you would think that this would be slow, because typically, if you've ever run a, a, a virtual machine or an emulator, you know, you've wanted to play a, a Wii game or something on your computer, and you've used an emulator, it's not necessarily super fast. It takes up a lot of CPU. Um, but that's because typically, you have this sort of like a translation layer, and then you're running a separate version of the operating system entirely. And so each individual VM might have you know, almost a gigabyte of, of RAM just devoted to the operating system itself, you know, running a separate copy of the operating system, not to mention the, you know, the slowdown of translating this between the, the CPU that's being emulated versus the actual CPU, which may be fast, but maybe not. However, Docker is clever. So what Docker does is it actually shares the operating system between the two of them using some fancy Linux things. Um, and so the, uh, the two containers actually have very little overhead. They each have their own version of the file system. They can each have their own version of Python and things like that. Um, but the base operating system is shared between them. Um, every once in a while, this might cause not necessarily security problems, but just problems with your dependencies, um, where like the operating system kernel is not the right version. I know, like for example, you need to be on version, I think, 14 or something like that of the Linux kernel to be able to mount uh, the new version of Windows file shares. And so like weird things like that will sometimes not work, but it's very, very rare. Um, and I, of course, this does only work if the server that's running this is using Linux. So if you're running this on Windows, uh, Docker, I think, actually will start up a virtual machine that runs Linux, and then it'll run all of your containers inside of that virtual machine. 
Um, and likewise, I don't even know if there's a way to run Windows on Docker, um, but typically it's used for uh, Linux on Linux. And because of that, it's, it's quite fast and very little overhead. Uh, it's also very small. It doesn't take up a lot of disk space. The reason for that is every single line in this file is cached individually. And so what it does is it caches the difference that, that happened between the previous line and the next line. So this is going to be cached. Any Docker container that uses Python 3.8 will load this particular image already done. This, the, the, the files that were changed in this line are the only thing that are gonna be cached for this line. So even if you have a hundred different container Docker file, you know, source code for Docker files, uh, it's only gonna download Python 3.8 once and you're gonna end up with a you know, relatively small um, file size for each one of these individually. It's called layer caching. Um, and so it saves a lot of hard disk space. Okay, so that's Docker. Um, we have these containers now. We have this really portable way to include our application and all of its dependencies. That's one thing I want you to keep in mind is we have this thing that is going to keep track of our application and all of its dependencies and allow us to run it by just specifying Docker run and then a name of an executable or something like that. It's not, it's not an executable again, it's called an image, but same general idea, right? Docker run it takes care of everything else for us. Remember that because we're gonna come back to this in a little bit when we talk about how this all fits together. Okay, so the second thing, and this is going to be the shortest section of the entire presentation because it's not as complicated as it sounds. The second thing is called cloud computing and you've probably heard of the cloud or you know, things like that. And here's what, we're, here's what we're looking at with cloud computing and why it came to be. So typically the way that you would do things um, if you wanted to run a, a website is you would buy a server. And as your website got more popular, you would then buy more servers and you would put them in physical uh, racks in a data center that you would rent out. And you would have a bunch of network cabling and a bunch of switches and things like that. You'd have to get a bunch of power. You'd need redundant power. You need cooling, by the way, managing cooling with this many computers is actually quite complicated. Um, so it's the old way you do things is you would build one of these every single time you wanted to, um, to, to run things. And you just have racks and racks of, of these servers, which are just computers, right? They're just computers that aren't really intended to be used directly with a keyboard and mouse, but they're computers nonetheless. You'd have just hundreds of them sitting here and you just gradually add more and more. There's a few problems with this. So one problem with this is that a lot of the time you're not going to make full use of your computers. So here's an example of the number of Steam users who are online playing games um, over the course of a week. And you can see here that there are some clear peaks and there are some clear valleys, right? Like there are some parts that have a lot more people and some parts that have a lot less people. And the span between those two is about six million, six to seven million people. So you can imagine that you're going to need enough servers to handle the full 20 million people that could be online but you most of the time are not going to have 20 million people. It's kind of like uh, Ikea parking lots. If you've ever been to Ikea, uh, you know how on Sundays, Saturdays and Sundays, it's usually really busy, but during the weekday, the parking lot is completely empty, but like half of the land of Ikea is devoted to parking lots, right? Which is not ideal. And so that's one problem with this is you end up with a lot of servers that are just kind of sitting there completely idle. Um, and in theory, maybe you could automate turning them on or off or something like that. And, you know, that would at least save you on the power, but you're still having to pay for all the servers, even, they're only, even though you're only using them for maybe 10 to 20% of the time um, for, for a lot of your servers. Uh, there are a few other pro problems with this, by the way. Another one might be, what if you grow really quickly, right? What if you're only at 5 million users and all of a sudden you make it on some really popular YouTube stream and then you get another 5 million users, right? You've just doubled double the number of users that you have. Um, and that can happen quite quickly and maybe it, it doubles really quickly and then it goes down really quickly, right? Maybe you're only popular for a few days. Um, it would be really inefficient to buy a bunch of servers for those few days and then you just have you know, twice as many servers and half of them are sitting off for the next two years, right? That's not efficient. Um, and then you know, the other thing is if you don't buy those servers, everyone is gonna leave because your thing is down for an entire week, right? Like that doesn't work either. So this is why this, you know, this is no longer the way that most people do things. Um, 
there are still some specific reasons why you might want to do this. And there are still a lot of people who do this. We actually have a physical server in a physical data center somewhere. It's beneficial for certain things for us. Um, but, you know, we're still we're leasing that space. We're not, we don't have hundreds of servers or anything like that. So the alternative to this is what's called cloud computing. And, and I really want to put this in contrast with that previous one because really fundamentally when you hear the word cloud you think oh it's really complicated there's you know i don't i don't know why it's a cloud and then you you know you imagine that there's something really really complicated and fundamentally what is cloud computing it's still this it's still exactly the same thing it is still physical servers sitting in a data center somewhere the only difference is instead of you owning the servers you lease them and you lease them by the minute and so if you need a bunch of computing power for five minutes, you can do that with cloud computing. You can't do that with typical servers. So this is why people like the cloud. Um, again, people do have actual servers uh, a lot of the time, but you know, in contrast, like you have all of these, these network racks um, and you're you know, building servers and you're putting them in racks yourself. And the nice thing about the cloud is that someone else is being paid to put those servers in the racks for you. And they're just being shared between a bunch of different people. You don't have to worry about the, you know, building the computers. You don't have to worry about the air conditioning for, for all those computers or anything else like that. Um, other people will worry about it for you. And because of that, there's kind of like an economy of scale, right? Like these companies can, can buy massive data centers and hire a bunch of people to manage them. Uh, you can't. Um, so that's that's a lot of what we're talking about with with cloud computing. Um, and so uh, cloud computing fundamentally, you know, is just a, a bunch of uh, server racks that are owned by Amazon or Microsoft or Google. Um, the cloud, again, I really want to emphasize this. It's just rented computers that you can rent by the minute. Um, this will become important. It's good to know this because we want to turn on and off computers at certain times as we get into this next uh, phase of what we're going to talk about. But again, it's just rented computers. The cloud is just someone else's computer. There's nothing fancy about it except a nice dashboard. And speaking of dashboards, this is basically what it looks like if you want to, you know, use the cloud. You'll get a dashboard. They're generally all pretty complicated. I think DigitalOcean is the least complicated and DigitalOcean is not as cloudish as the others. But you'll see, um, this is Amazon's cloud, Amazon Web Services. You've probably heard of it. It's, I think it's the most popular. Um, and this is what it's like if I want to create a new machine. This is, you know, I went through this seven stage wizard. There were a lot of acronyms. There are a lot of acronyms in cloud computing. That is the most difficult part is uh, either learning the acronyms or learning to ignore most of the acronyms because you generally don't need most of them. Um, but, uh, you know, there are a lot of acronyms. Don't let it overwhelm you. You can ignore a lot of them. Um, but this is what it would look like in general. And, you know, you'll see all these weird terms and stuff like that. Again, I don't even know what half these terms mean. And I've been using this for 10 or 15 years just because I haven't really had a need to use most of those terms. Um, but uh, Amazon Web Services is the easiest cloud uh, to uh, get started with, I think, because there's a lot of tutorials and things like that. Um, we actually use Microsoft Azure. The reason for that is entirely that they give us more free money as a nonprofit than Amazon does. Um, I think their dashboard is a little bit less overwhelming. But both of them are still pretty overwhelming. Um, but this is what the uh, the Azure dashboard looks like for us. And you can see uh, we actually have, you know, a bunch of IP addresses that are listed separately in here and a bunch of network cards that are listed in here. And if I were to scroll down, I would see all the individual virtual machines that are basically, you know, rented servers that we're getting. I can specify the size, you know, the, the you know, like the, the storage size, the amount of RAM that we're getting, the, the number of CPUs. And it's actually quite convenient because I can actually, when we're doing something like Code Cup, I can start up more of them um, because we'll, you know, have a, several thousand people trying to access this website and, you know, simultaneously very, very quickly. And I can just shut them down when they're done, or I can pick a, a bigger uh, virtual machine. Uh, actually, for a while, we were using the software that Facebook made for running Code Cup our cybersecurity challenge, and it's remarkably inefficient. So with about 2,000 people uh, playing uh, Code Cup on this, and it, it wasn't able to scale the multiple servers, it had to be run all on one server. Uh, we actually bought the largest server we possibly could, uh, which if we had run it for an entire month, I think would have cost us about $20,000. But because we only needed it for an hour, we just scaled it up to that larger size. And then when it was done, we shut it down. We, we told uh, Azure to make it smaller again. And then we only got billed like, you know, $20 instead of 20,000. So pretty neat. 
Okay. So that's the cloud. So again, we built these two uh, useful subjects to us so far, right? The first thing that we have is we have this ability for our software to be in these containers that are really portable and very easy to run on different machines and you can run multiples of them on one machine. The second thing we have is these machines that can run containers or anything you want, but they can run containers and we can turn them on and turn them off at, at will, right? The third thing we're going to talk about is how we start to coordinate some of this stuff. And that's uh, typically called orchestration. Um, some people break it down and call it like scheduling. And then there's a service mesh. And there's a lot of like terms that you see here. Uh, but generally, I've heard people refer to this as orchestration. Um, and some software that you might have heard uh, mentioned would probably be Kubernetes or K8S. Uh, if you ever see that word in there, that's one of the systems that manages this container orchestration thing. Um, the one that we use is called Nomad. I think it's a little bit easier to use and a little bit more simple. Um, so that's what we use. But um, you know, there there are a few there are a few different options out there. So container orchestration. What it's doing is it's sort of we're going to connect these two subjects that we've talked about, Docker and the cloud. We're going to connect them together and uh, and sort of talk about how we can use all of this together to make it very easy to run our software in complicated ways. So here is what. Uh, the architecture for something like this will generally look like. And this is more or less what ours looks like, actually, what all of the software you're using today more or less looks like this. Um, if you go to any of our websites or if you filled out the Code Labs matching survey or anything like that, it's all running on a system like this. So you have N servers. It could be one, it could be a thousand, it could be 10,000, however many you need. You have N of these cloud servers. They, they could be physical servers, by the way. It'd be, be fine if they were physical servers as well, right? There's no reason they have to be cloud servers, but typically you'll run this on the cloud for, for a few reasons we'll talk about in a second. Um, so you have N of these, and each one is running Docker, that thing that, that is able to start and stop and remap those containers. And then they run this thing uh, called an agent. Uh, an orchestration agent, or Kubernetes has their own their own version of this, and they have like eight different subsections. Um, but easy way to think of this as is as a you know a standalone group of things. And then up here at the top, we have this uh, you know the, a separate server that's running a controller, an orchestrator controller. And so um, Nomad, I think the one that we use, calls this a server, and it calls this an agent. Again, Kubernetes has their own terms. But the general idea is that this is going to control all of these machines. And by the way, I drew this as one, but typically you'd have multiple just for redundancy, because if one of them went down, things would just stop working. So we actually have three. Um, so uh, on each one of these things, we can write uh, what's called a job definition, or uh, Kubernetes, I think most people use the thing called a Helm chart. Um, but it'll, it'll do the same thing. Uh, so this is not exactly, but kind of in a hand wavy way what a job definition looks like. Um, so we'll break it down by parts. So first of all, we were telling it like, we're going to run this Docker image, right? So this is a name of something that we pushed up to Docker Hub. Um, it's one of those images, it's already been built. The image is hosted on Docker Hub. And we're telling our, our um, our orchestration controller that this job is going, to, is going to use this image. We can set some environment variables that will be passed to that image. It's kind of like calling a function with arguments, right? If you don't want this, this image could be public, right? And so you don't necessarily want your database password in there, or maybe you want to be able to reuse it in multiple situations. So like you, you want to run two of these and one of these is for testing and one of these is for the live version. So you can pass in variables that, that your uh, scripts inside of your Docker con con container can actually read. Um, you can configure what amount of CPU your task is going to need or what amount of memory it's going to need. So I can sort of constrain these tasks to say, you know, if, if this really goes out of control, rather than taking down the entire machine by running out of memory, uh, the orchestrator is just going to restart it, which is pretty convenient. Likewise, it, because it knows how much memory your, your task might take, it can figure out how to pack multiple containers onto one physical server, which we'll see in a second. We can also do things like tell it what network ports it's going to need, which are also very convenient. And one of the neat things that this can do as well is if a service is only available internally, you can even have it assign a random available network port and be able to discover that as well. But in this case, I actually made a typo that should be a static is equal to 443, but um, 
HTTPS is typically on port 443. And so we're telling the orchestrator in this job file, we're telling it, we want you to run code day on a specific server with these environment variables. It has this much CPU and this much memory, and um, it's going to get port 80. So all traffic going to that server on port 80 goes to this container. Um, again, a little bit hand wavy. The job definitions actually look a little bit longer than this. I couldn't fit it on all on here without making it size four font, um, but not super complicated. So what happens now is we, we tell the orchestrator we want to run this job definition, which tells it again how to run a container. It tells it what arguments this container is going to take and what, it, what resources it needs. We send that job file to our controller. And it, by the way, like Nomad, the one that we use is actually just an HTTP post request. We're basically just posting it, sending an HTTP request to the controller. The controller then will find one of these servers that's, that's running the agent that has space for it, that has that a port available, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, basically, it'll find one of these servers that has the resources it needs, and it will communicate with that orchestrator agent and tell it to start this container. That orchestrator agent will talk to Docker, give Docker all the information it needs to actually run the container, and then the container starts running. And that is how software is fundamentally deployed in a lot of cases nowadays. Um, and when we get to continuous integration and continuous delivery, uh, we'll actually talk about why this is very, very, very beneficial. Um, so someone asked in the, in the question and answer, is it accurate to think of Kubernetes or Nomad as the bridge between the cloud and our containerized application? I think that that's somewhat accurate, yes. Um, again, you could run all of these instead of being cloud servers, they could be physical servers. Um, and in our case, and uh, when we're done with this, I can actually show you some of our stuff live. Um, in our case, we actually have three servers that are running on the cloud and one server that's running in a physical data center. And the physical data center that is, um, that is hosting the, um, the physical server, uh, we don't have tons of um, bandwidth because it's free. It's being de donated very kindly by a company called Greenhouse Data. Um, and it is in a very, very expensive location, which is uh, the Weston building, which is kind of where all the ISPs connect in the, on the West Coast. Um, so they very kindly donated to us. They don't give us a ton of free bandwidth. And so that one, for example, I want to use only for computationally intensive loads, but not necessarily ones that are publicly internet accessible a lot of the time. Um, or if they, if they are, they're usually ones that don't require a lot of bandwidth. Um, so it could be a physical server, it could be the cloud. Um, but basically the, or the orchestration system is the bridge between your um, containerized application and the servers it's running on. In, in short, right, uh, which could be the cloud. So the way I've been talking about it all right now, you're 100% right. In reality, this is all a little bit hand wavy and, and you're about 90% right. And you know, it's actually just the physical servers. But yeah, it's the bridge between those. The alternative way to do this would be, you know, to SSH into all the servers manually and, and run them all one by one. So good question. Um, another question from the Q&A and feel free to, to keep the questions coming. Um, this is a great time to, to break for, for some questions. So another question from the Q&A, is Docker Compose a container orchestrator? Docker Compose is kind of like half of a container orchestrator. Docker Compose can run containers on one computer and one computer only. What it can't do is schedule containers to run on different computers. Docker had for a long time, and we used to use, a thing called Docker Swarm that would take files uh, that were similar to Docker Compose files and be an orchestrator. It would, run, it would find a computer to run it on and it would run it. Um, it still technically exists. They don't say it's deprecated, but there are bugs that have not been fixed for over a year that are pretty major bugs. Um, the reason we switched off of it was because we tried to resize a server one day and it refused to start back up. It took about an hour to get it to start back up. It took down our entire cluster. Um, and uh, it turned out that it was an open issue that was introduced in a change made in January, and this was in August. And the issue was brought up in January. So um, Docker has a version of Docker Compose that can run it on multiple servers like an orchestrator, but it, it's not really supported anymore. And Docker Compose itself can only run it on one computer. But if you think of kind of Docker Compose with multiple computers, you're generally on the right track. Um, and if you don't know what Docker Compose is, don't worry about it. Um, it's again, it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like this job file in a different format, and it can only run it on one computer instead of multiple. So, good question as well. Cool. So we'll keep moving. Um, so we have 
our orchestrator controller tells the different servers to, um, to start up these, uh, these containers. Um, and I'll answer the question that just came in just a sec. Um, so we are telling our, our thing to, to run these containers. And again, one of the nice things about this is because it knows that this container is only going to need, let's say, 256 megs of RAM, and our server, let's say, has 16 gigs or whatever, it knows it can run multiple on them, which is pretty cool. Until it runs out of disk or memory or CPU, it will continue to pack that server full of, of um, applications. And it'll actually it'll distribute it across all of them if it can. But then it'll start packing them in on one. And so you can end up with a bunch of different containers together. Um, and someone was asking in the, in the chat, like, what do you mean when you said cluster? Basically this, right? You have a bunch of computers that are kind of operating together, but independently in service of a common goal. Um, and so I, colloquially, I think a lot of people would just term anything that sort of is of this system a cluster. I don't know, there's probably some technical actual definition, but um, I'd call this a cluster because it's a bunch of computers working together to do a, a common task, which is run all these containers for us. Also a good question. There's a lot of terms in computer science. Um, when I started back in 2000, I don't know, probably 2007 or eight, when I was really initially getting into this, there were a lot less terms. I feel bad for everyone who's trying to get into this now because now you have like 5,000 extra terms to know. And it's not necessarily that it's gotten more complicated. It has a little bit, but also just there's so many words you have to understand. So I do feel bad for everyone. Um, and I'll, I'll try not to use too many words without explaining it. Okay, so we have all these containers. Uh, now some of you might ask, well, what if these containers need to talk to each other? How do I know how this container could talk to this container, right? Let's say the website needs to talk to the database, which is a pretty common pattern, right? They're not on the same server even. Presumably they're on the same network. So at least they, they physically can talk to each other, right? They're on the same LAN. But how do we actually get them to talk to each other? Well, I was a little bit hand wavy when I said we had an orchestrator controller. Most um, systems actually break this up into a few different uh, things. And so separately, you'll have this other thing that's called a service registry. Um, or sometimes this will be called a service mesh if it does the connection part as well, like the networking part as well. But um, registry is a little bit easier to understand the, the term. It, it registers things. And so we have this controller which is telling things to run. And then we have this registry where all of these containers register themselves and say, I am running on this machine. I have these ports. I do X, Y, Z. Um, and so you can see the website in this diagram is talking to the service registry. And the database is talking to the service registry. And if the website wants to find out the address of the database, which again could move around, so it could change, all the website needs to do is connect to the service registry and ask it, you know, what, where is the thing tagged database located? So all these things would have tags, right? They'd have a name or, or something else. And the service registry itself can say, oh yeah, the database is located on the server 10.0.3.3 uh, .3 and is on port 5500. Um, that's what this thing does. It, it just sort of keeps a list and then when things shut down, it, it, it gets, gets rid of them. Um, some of these can do more complicated things, but again, I'm going to be a little bit hand wavy here because I don't think you need to know all the technical details. If you want to ask more questions, feel free, but think of it as a place where they register themselves and, and other ones can go in there to look up where they're, they're at. It's kind of like DNS, if you've ever uh, bought a website and configured DNS, um, but uh, pretty um, more instantaneous, I think. Um, and so someone raised their hand, so I'm going to actually put on my headphones so I can hear you. And then go ahead. Uh, you're muted, by the way. OK, I don't know if he clicked raise hand by mistake, so I will lower hand. <laughs> um, if you have a question, feel free to post it in the Q&A, um, and, and we can get to it from there. Okay, cool. He clicked it by accident. Um, okay, so uh, we are uh, back to this thing. We have our website and our database that are talking together. Now, remember when I said that the uh, you know these could move around? That's why we have this service registry, right? Because we need to know where they're located right now. We need to know what server they're on right now. They can move around. This is very very cool um, because we have this database here. And what if we need to shut down this server for whatever reason? Maybe. 
our website is now less um, popular. You know, it's, it's 3 a.m. We don't have that many visitors. We want to tell our cloud service provider to shut down half of our servers. Now, all of these servers have services running. We can shut off some of the services. We can say scale down the number of services that you're running, right? And it'll, it'll scale down the services. It, you know, one of the things we can do for this is tell it we want it to run 10, and it'll run 10 of them. And then we can say, bring it back down to five, and it'll do that, and it'll shut down the services, uh, the containers, right? It'll shut down the containers. I'm using those two words kind of interchangeably. It'll shut down the containers, um, but uh, you know, maybe this server still needs to be shut down and it has a database on it, right? One of the cool things that our orchestrator can do is it can move the database. And databases, by the way, have storage, right? So there's a little hard disk attached to this somewhere virtually. I don't know how the cloud providers have it all set up, but theoretically there's a, there's a hard disk attached to this server that the database is writing to. What the orchestrator can do is it can actually move you know, when we're shutting down the server, it will, uh, we, we mark the server as what's called draining, which means get rid of all these things so we can shut it down safely. And the orchestrator will move the database somewhere else. And it'll actually use something called CSI um, to uh, detach the hard drive from this computer and move it over to this computer. So basically it'll talk directly to our cloud uh, provider, whether it be Amazon or Azure or whatever else, it'll talk to their API and tell them disconnect this hard drive, move it over here. And so the orchestrator will just magically, when we tell it this server is going offline, move the things away, the orchestrator will, you know, shut down the database service, the, this container, it'll, it'll turn it off gracefully, it will detach the disk, it'll tell the cloud provider to move the disk to this other server, it'll move the database over there, it'll tell the database to start on that server, and then it'll shut down the server. Very, very cool. All of this is sort of magic, right? And in our case with Nomad, I literally tick a box and it does all of this for us, which is very neat. Um, same deal if we wanna scale things up, I just start up more servers, it'll gradually start rebalancing things onto new servers as well. Cool, so this is what Nomad actually looks like, by the way. I know that this is all really complicated. We have all these diagrams. This is what it looks like. Um, the reason, one of the reasons we use Nomad is because we're a really small team. Kubernetes is a lot more complicated and uh, we don't really have anyone who could even part-time really uh, manage just Kubernetes. And so one of the reasons we use Nomad is it's a lot simpler, it's easier to understand. And so we have a few people who are part-time on our team who understand how this works and are capable of maintaining it and fixing bugs and things like that. Um, but one of the reasons why it's so nice is because it has this really beautiful database. And so this is a list of all of our containers that are running. Uh, Nomad calls them each services, and the reason for that is because, again, maybe uh, CodeCup has five individual containers that are all running. You know, there's, there's five instances of this container because we have a lot of people accessing it and we want to distribute the load. Um, so it calls them services. It's kind of a group of containers. Um, but yeah, so this is what it looks like. It's, it's very nice, very easy to see, um, things like that. Um, this is what a console, which is our service registry, looks like. And so you can see, here's our blog, blog.codeday.org. And uh, it's named blog-http. And you can see it's running on two different servers, uh, 10.0.3.33 on port 22868, and 10.0.3.34 on port 31664. And I'm on our VPN right now, so I'm connected to this network with all of our servers, and I could actually visit that in a web browser and it would work for me. It will work for you because those are all private IPs, but, but yeah, it would work for me. There's some other nice things I can do. You can see there's a bunch of stuff over here. Basically, it automatically configures itself to receive traffic um, so that the, the web front ends, like all the traffic goes to one IP address and it gets routed to the right server, but anyway, not super complicated to understand. You can see that these are just unique IDs. All this is kind of magically taken care of for us, and it's pretty neat. Okay, so we're gonna pull all of this together and that's a lot of content. So if anyone has any questions for me, feel free to ask them in the Q&A now. Um, we're gonna pull all of this together and talk about how we can sort of automate everything that we've just learned so that everything just magically works perfectly and is really awesome and super easy to work with. Um, and we're gonna talk about that through the context of what's called a CI or CD pipeline. Um, there's a lot of tools to use this. We use one called Circle CI. Um, but the easiest and free one that you would probably want to use, um, unless you have very specific use cases like we do, would be GitHub Actions. And you might have heard of this. GitHub Actions can, um, can receive uh, basically events. So like when you commit to something and it can, it can take actions based on those. Um, 
And uh, I'll get to the question that just came in in a sec because I think that'll be better at the end. So, okay. So uh, the old way, um, this is how we used to do things, right? We would run tests, we would commit code, we would run the build command, or maybe you know three and two could be switched, whatever. Run the build command. We'd schedule a certain downtime, right? We do like really big releases, like V2 is gonna be like a really big release. And then we tell all of our customers that our server is gonna be down from 12 to 2 a.m. on a, you know, on a Saturday or something like that. And then like someone manually goes and connects to each server and like typically in the old days would actually like copy all the files over. Nowadays you could say, okay, they'd run Docker containers or something, but like that's still not ideal, right? Not, not super great. Um, so, this is the new way of doing things, is, is, is automating as much of this as possible and making it completely automatic so we can do things continuously, where the word continuous comes from in CI and CD. So this is the new way. Someone does get push. Tests are run. Hopefully you have tests in your code. Generally a good idea to have tests. So someone does get push. Um, when you get push, a, a, a system, either GitHub, Actions or Circle CI or Travis CI or Jenkins or there's a lot of different options. Um, notices that a get push has happened and it runs some tests in your code. And if your test fail, that's it. It comments on the GitHub action and says test failed. Nothing happens. Um, nothing continues generally unless you want it to, but that'd be a bad idea because your test failed. So first of all, it'll help you not ship crappy software, which is nice. But in the alternative, um, if everything passes, then it'll run to a build phase. Right? And if you don't have tests, it would just run directly to the build phase. We actually don't have tests for 100% of our projects. So some of ours just run directly to build phase. And if it doesn't start, then you know, we know it doesn't work. Um, and then the build phase, uh, is, this system will automatically build things for you. And, and it'll produce what's called build artifacts. So what are some things it might build? Uh, what are these artifacts? A Docker image could be one could build an executable. It could even build documentation pages for you. So if you are, uh, some people will have their documentation pages automatically generated from the comments in their code. Whenever you do a commit, it'll automatically build the new documentation pages so that the docs are constantly up to date with what's in the code, which is very neat. Now in our case, we're gonna say that it builds a Docker image because in, in most of our um, projects that we run, a Docker image is indeed what we're using. So, our, our CI system can automatically publish that image, Docker push, push it to Docker Hub. Um, so now it's on Docker Hub. And I wanna take a brief interlude to talk about uh, the system that we're running this on. Cause we talked about how we would have all of those containers, right? We'd have multiple different containers. Let's say that we're building a really complicated system. We have this Docker image that represents our application and we have a really, really large system. This could be Netflix or Slack or Facebook or something like that. And we have a lot of individual instances of this Docker container that are all running on, on separate servers, right? This is, I don't even know how many, I don't remember how many I put in here. There's a lot of them. You can imagine that someone like Slack probably has a lot of Docker containers, right? So we have a bunch of them. Typically what will happen is a request will come in. It'll go to a thing called a load balancer. I'm gonna be hand wavy about that. It could be a physical piece of hardware. It could be a cloud provider thing. It could be running on the orchestrator itself as is the case for us. Um, go to a thing called a load balancer and this load balancer will just, um, I, another thing that I added here, by the way, is there could even be multiple. So maybe the client picks a load balancer at random, which is the thing you can do as well if you have a really, really big application. Um, so it'll pick a, a load balancer and then um, as the request comes in, it'll, the load balancer will just pick a random instance, a random Docker container and let that Docker container serve the request. Um, typically it'll try to give the request to the same Docker container if that's available, um, unless you tell it not to, but anyway. So it'll pick a random Docker container and it'll sort of distribute them randomly. Um, and again, there's a little bit of hand waviness going on. Sometimes there are heuristics that it looks at to figure out which container to give it to, but anyway, pick a random one. It could be that one, it could be that one, it could be this one down here. It doesn't really matter which one. Okay, so I just want you to remember this is the architecture that we're talking about because this is how we're gonna talk about deployments. Um, this will work at smaller scales. It doesn't have to be like a thousand containers. It could be like three containers. Um, but it, you know, it won't work for one exactly, but you can still kind of do the general same idea. So, okay, so now back to our main thing. So we have git push, runs tests, runs build, produces this Docker image, this Docker image goes to Docker Hub and dot, 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 it goes into this deployment phase. 
So now what we can do is we can tell our orchestration system, our container orchestrator, I have a new version of our software, please roll it out for me. Now, what our orchestrator can be configured to do, it doesn't have to be, but it can be configured to do this, and this is the way a lot of large companies do things. It can be configured to look at this pool of applications, right? We have all of these applications, they're all running V5. It will upgrade one random application to V6, and then it will wait some amount of time. And what will happen is this load balancer, which is randomly assigning requests to different, uh, different containers, every once in a while will assign a user to this version, this uh, container on one of our servers that's running V6. And if that doesn't fail, like if nothing goes dramatically wrong, right? So it doesn't seem like anything's going wrong. Our tests all pass, but maybe something, maybe something slipped through. Well, if nothing seems like it's going wrong, um, that's an extra slide. Nothing seems like it's going wrong. Now what our, our deployment system is gonna do is it'll roll it out to maybe 10%. So we'll go from maybe 1% to 10%. And now some of these will start to get traffic. And if again, nothing fails, now it'll roll it out to 50%. And again, if half of our users are using the new version of our web application and nothing is going wrong, then finally it'll roll it out to 100%. Um, and this is generally called a blue-green deployment, I think. Um, there's other systems of doing this. Uh, you can do a thing, what we do, because we don't have this many uh, instances of things running. We don't have that many people using our website. We just do a thing called a canary deployment, where it just sort of deploys an extra one over here to the side, waits for a while, sees if anything is going terribly wrong, and if nothing's going terribly wrong, it swaps it out. But um, generally, something like this. So again, I want to I want to go back to this diagram really quickly. I should have just put it back in there again. All of this has happened automatically. Everything from here on, everything from this very first step, happened automatically just because we did a get push. So it ran the tests, it ran the build, it made the Docker image, it deployed the Docker image to. 1% of our users, to 10% of our users, to 50% of our users, to 100% of our users, automatically all in the background, very, very neat. Um, and it makes it amazingly fast to roll out a new version of a web application um, to a large group of users who don't want to have a lot of downtime. Uh, so very, very, very cool. Okay, so um, I wanna just to wrap things up uh, there are four things that we've talked about today that, that most companies nowadays, at least most tech companies, most startup tech companies certainly, but even a lot of larger tech companies, uh, most companies in some ways are some way are using most of these things. Containers, cloud computing resources, container orchestration systems, and continuous integration or continuous deployment. Uh, so with that in mind, um, if you want any of these slides, I put them on this particular loca uh, location, xanity.ws, which is one of my websites, slash presentations, slash 2020-07-30-deploying-software.pdf. Uh, this is recorded on YouTube, so if you forget this and you want to go back and revisit it, uh, feel free to do that. Um, again, I know that this hasn't been super practical hands-on. There's a lot more than we could possibly cover hands-on on how to do this, but I wanted to give you those diagrams and the general concept of what's going on, because when you go out into the workforce, there's a very good chance you're going to interact with these systems, and having a mental picture of what's going on is hopefully going to help you be a little bit more successful um, and and get up to speed a little bit more quickly. And I don't know that most schools are teaching really any of these at this point. Um, so with that, I'll go to questions. Um, I'm going to uh, quit out of this uh, presentation uh, so that I can also pull up a, a version of our things. Um, let's do this. Uh, I'll, I'll pull up a version of some of our things so that we can actually look through it live as, uh, as we're talking about some of these, these questions. Um, okay, so uh, one question that we have, uh, I saw multiple Docker containers in the orchestration diagram. What would go in each container? Why can't you have a few or even one? Uh, it's a good question. So in many cases, if you're just running one website, it would be fine if you had just one Docker container, right? If, if it's a very simple website, you could put it all in one. Now, typically it's considered bad practice to put two applications in one Docker container. One of the reasons for that is it's hard to understand, it's hard to reuse. Another reason for that is that oftentimes what we'll see is something like our front end might need more instances 
than our back end, right? Because a lot of people are requesting websites, but maybe only certain people are going to be modifying requests, right? Might be one reason. Um, another reason is certain, certain uh, containers might need to serve requests for multiple containers. So in our case, uh, for the labs matching system, uh, we use a search database called Elastic, um, which helps us do searching. And uh, the search database is um, also used for some other things. So like you can imagine general search on a website also uses Elastic. And so if we were to try to put Elastic inside of the, um, the same container that's running that portal for your, your matching website where you're filling out your matches, that wouldn't really be very efficient because then we would end up with two versions of Elastic running, even though most of them are just going to be sort of sitting there idle most of the time, but they still need the CPU in case they need it. Um, so that, that's, that's another reason you'll often see this is so that you can scale up and down each one individually. Uh, what are some examples of services that you might run? So you might think that the, the, the code day, um, system is very simple, right? We just have a few websites, um, right? Like codedata.org, virtual.codedata.org. We, we have a few websites. We could all put them on one server. Here's how we've broken it down. So in terms of our websites, uh, we have the labs website is one Docker container. We have the, the virtual code day website is another Docker container. Um, the labs matching portal is a separate uh, Docker container. Uh, the code day website is a separate Docker container. We have this system that's really cool called Code Day Posters, uh, where when we are having physical in-person Code Day hackathon style events, which has kind of our, usually been our main thing, um, that can automatically generate posters with a promo code for a specific school um, in a bunch of different styles. Uh, we have Code Day Present, which will automatically generate um, kickoff and, and ending decks. Uh, we have a, a projects uh, page that shows all the projects that have been created at different things. We have Code Cup. Um, which is our um, capture the flag thing. Code Cup, by the way, even though codeday.org might not be getting a lot of traffic, Code Cup oftentimes we've needed to go up to as many as 12 servers just dedicated to Code Cup because we have three, 4,000 people refreshing the page constantly. Um, and, and those of you who played Code Cup back in the days before you were using the system will remember that it used to always go down. It doesn't now because we have this system that will automatically scale it. Um, so we have in total, I think, about 50 services. Um, and they're all sort of, you know, they, they all use different things. And one of the nice benefits to this is we have a lot of volunteers who are contributing to this. And so as a volunteer, rather than having one single monolith that has all of your code in one really big GitHub repository, it's much easier for a new volunteer to come in and contribute to something small versus something big. Um, there's some disadvantages to having this many services as well. Um, and there was a, um, a watch party that I think we had in the, in the first or the second week uh, called like, Avoiding Microservice Mega Disasters uh, that talks a little bit about some of the, the disadvantages to having these services. Um, but for us as an engineering decision, it made a lot of sense because it makes it easier for volunteers to contribute to a repository that's not very active and has uh, one to 2,000 lines of code versus a, you know, a, 20,000 line of code monolith that does everything. Um, and by the way, uh, so we actually don't do fully automated deployment. We have a thing where we can manually control which version of something is deployed. Um, so if you want to see, oops, uh, code.cloud. Uh, this is all internal. You won't be able to access any of this on, uh, on your own computer. But um, here's all of our services, and we can actually update them. Uh, so you can see, there's a, here's all the running ones right now. And uh, if I go to labs page, we can actually see, you know, here's the version this morning that we deployed that has the demo day submissions. Um, but uh, here's where we added the prototype day page. Here's where we added the weekly reflection, reflection page. You know, all the way back to here's where we added uh, displaying information about who the speakers were. Um, and if I wanted to deploy a new version, I'd actually just click this and click deploy. Um, same deal if I wanted to increase the number of these containers that are running, if I wanted three version of the labs website because it's becoming really popular. Um, you can do something called auto scaling, which uh, the container orchestrator will detect that you're getting a lot of traffic on one of these containers. The CPU usage is going really high and, and start up more of them. We haven't set that up for simplicity. Um, and so, you know, I could just say I want five versions of the labs website and it'll automatically run five of them. I can show you that, for example, if I go to our blog and I say, I want to go back, to, uh, let's say I want to go up to three. I want to go up to three containers running on our blog. Over here, I'll look at our blog and you'll see that Nomad has actually just started running this third one. 
uh, which is, again, very, very neat. Two of these are already running because we already had two of them running. And uh, I've desired three. And so one of them is, is actively deploying right now. And you can see, again, if I go to any one of these, I can click on the internal IP address because I'm on our VPN, access it internally, um, which is also kind of cool. OK, uh, where does software like Jenkins X fall in this stack? I think Jen I know what Jenkins X is, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to double check that I'm, I'm not speaking about something that I'm wrong. OK, so this is cloud applications and Kubernetes. Uh, this is, is going to be the system that, that manages your uh, continuous integration. Um, I don't know what's up with tracking protection. It's like is it ad block, maybe? I don't know. Something weird is going on with this website. Um, when I was talking about that continuous integration thing, basically there's a bunch of systems that will take that definition of what you want to do and run it. Um, Jenkins is one, um, Circle CI is one, uh, you know, GitHub Actions is one, um, Travis CI I think is another. Um, and if you want to look at what this looks like, uh, I'll also pull up one of our uh, applications. We'll take a look at, let's say, the labs website, because I pushed an update to that this morning. We have this file on the labs website um, in the .circleci folder that tells CircleCI what to do. And you can see that it's got a build step. What it does is it checks out the code. It turns on caching um, for performance reasons. Um, it uh, sets some variables, uh, builds the Docker container from the, that uh, Docker file. So it automatically builds it, it tags it, and then it pushes it to, uh, to the um, Docker uh, hub. Um, and then it also posts a status message. It says Slack, but it's actually on Discord. So it posts a status message on Discord automatically. Um, the biggest difference between these systems is just what this config file is going to look like. They all kind of do the same thing, unless you have like a really specific need for one specific thing. For us, it's actually layer caching. You can generally use any of these. And I think most people are probably using GitHub Actions now because it's free and it's built into GitHub. Um, but all these will basically do pretty much the same thing. And, and you can see if I log in, Give it a sec. And you can see um, here is all of our builds. And this one had an error. So, you know, testing. Um, and then, you know, you can also click through and see here's the part where it checked out the code, here's the part where it built this, um, this Docker container, um, and, you know, then it pushed it to the, the Docker hub which is pretty, pretty neat. So it'll do all that for us. Uh, fun funnily enough, uh, CircleCI, and I think most of these, actually use Docker containers themselves to run the build process. And so this actually creates a Docker container to build our Docker container. So like Dockerception, um, which is pretty funny. OK, another question. Um, if you are building a new startup from the ground up, should you set up CI, CD, and container orchestration from the start, or should you wait until you have more traction? Uh, good question. Um, I would probably say wait until you have like some traction, but not a ton. Like it's it's harder to set things up once you have a lot of people using it. I wouldn't wait until you you have like ten thousand users to set this up because it's going to be a slower process. But like if you're at the stage where no one is going to care if your website goes down for five or ten minutes every once in a while, like that's fine. Um, if you're at the stage where your customers are going to notice if your website goes down for a minute or two, or if you're at the stage where you have a lot of people working on this and you want to make sure that people aren't stepping on each other's toes, that's the point where I'd start to think about setting this up. Um, and for us, um, we got to that point. It became a lot easier for us to, to have volunteers working on things this way because now any volunteer can deploy software. They don't even need to have access to our servers, um, which is convenient for us because we can't give them access to our servers in most cases. Um, the other thing to know is that uh, container orchestration itself can be taken care of by a lot of cloud providers. Um, Amazon has a thing, I think it's called uh, ECS, Elastic Container Service. Um, and uh, Microsoft uh, has one, I don't remember what it's called. Uh, Google has the, I think GKE, Google Kubernetes Engine. Um, so there's a, there's a bunch of different options uh, out there that, that will take care of the orchestration for you. Uh, one of the disadvantages to that, though, is you're locked into a specific platform. And we wanted to run our own, um, both because we don't really like being locked in in general, and also because we get free money on different clouds at different times of the year. And running our own means we can actually have servers in all three of our, our, of our systems, our uh, data center, Amazon, and Azure. 
and then uh, we can just run our workloads on whichever one happens to be the most convenient. Okay, it looks like that's all the questions. Do we have any additional questions? Let me uh, pull this over here and I'll take a look at our Twitch chat. Um, but it doesn't look like there's any additional questions. Uh, cool. So with that in mind, um, if you do have any more questions for me, uh, you know where to get in touch. Um, that for anyone in Code Labs on the Discord, uh, my personal email is x at tyler.vc. V is in Victor, C is in Charlie. Um, so uh, if you want to send me an email and you're watching from a recording or something like that, feel free. And again, that ver version of these slides is available online. Um, if you do have any questions in the future uh, and you just remember this presentation, you're having difficulty understanding what's going on in your job and want to refer to it, go to it on there. Um, don't expect anyone to use this in their code day project, but hopefully it's something that's that's good to know, or sorry, your code labs project. Hopefully it's something that's good to know uh, for the future. And uh, thank you all for coming. So have a good night. <laughs>